Good evening to everyone. Uh, my name is Van Hubbard, and I'm with the Division Digestive Diseases and Nutrition of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases. And I'd like to welcome everybody to our initial lecture and in our second year of providing a clinical nutrition and obesity lecture series. As we have done in the series last year, we have made arrangements through the cooperation of the nutrition department of the clinical center for dietitians to receive CEUs uh, for attendance at these lectures. And there is a sign-up sheet in the back of the room for those that want CEUs uh, from the ADA. In addition, through the Foundation for Advancements of Education and Sciences, Within the NIH, uh, there will be um, provision to receive CME credits for physicians. And to do so, there is an evaluation form and uh, a page where you can sign up and provide your name and other information and indicate that you do want uh, CME credits uh, as a physician. In addition, I would appreciate any others of you that would like to fill out an evaluation form uh, to do so, and we will try to take your comments into consideration as we design future series of this sort. This evening, we are pleased to have Dr. Uh, James Hill, who is currently Associate Professor for Pediatrics and Medicine and Associate Director uh, for the Research Center for Human Nutrition at the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. He is a member of our National Task Force for the Prevention and Treatment of Obesity and also has the unique experience of heading off this lecture series last year and due to depart, uh, popular demand, as well as trying to get him to do it again and, and improve on his past performance, um, we have invited him back this year. And it is also particularly significant that he was one of the co-organizers and co-chairman of a workshop that was held on the NIH campus last December on physical activity and obesity. And he will also include an update uh, related to the outcome of that conference uh, during part of the pre presentation. And so I welcome uh, Jim to, again, initiate this, this uh, series of lectures. The, the titles for all the lectures in the series and the dates are also provided on the back table in the, in the, in the back of the auditorium. Van told me I had to keep doing it till I get it right, so hopefully tonight I can do it right and I won't have to come back and do it again next time. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm always amazed to, uh, to get this sort of crowd at this time of the evening. It's, uh, I, I hope we, uh, we can, can talk about some things that are interesting to you in the area of obesity. The, the title uh, of the talk tonight is Physical Activity, Diet Composition, and Obesity, and I want to start out by presenting a model which represents my current thinking uh, about obesity. It may not represent anyone else's in the area, but um, it, it's a model that's sort of guiding the research we're doing. Then to talk a little bit about how that model may be affected by physical activity and by diet composition. And throughout the talk, trying to relate these factors both to treatment of obesity and prevention of obesity. Uh -oh. Okay. Do I do the lights here? Um, I, I think of body weight, uh, the, the level of body weight maintained as a settling point. This is a concept introduced years ago by Wirtschafter and, and Davis. It's different from a set point. Uh, a settling point is, is the point that results from a num number of other systems, all of which are regulated. The key concept here is that body weight, body composition, body fat, may not itself have to be regulated per se. It may be the result of many other systems. If we start at the top, I think no one would dispute that we have genetic and non-genetic influences on body weight. 
and, and this determines what I'll call the characteristics of the organism. Then I think it's useful to divide those into sort of a behavioral phenotype and a metabolic phenotype, both of which, again, are influenced by genetic and non-genetic factors. The sum of these behavioral and metabolic phenotypes would be the functional phenotype of the individual. And it's through the functional phenotype that a situation of energy balance is reached, where intake equals expenditure, body weight and body composition are stable. We've been very interested in looking at the metabolic phenotype, particularly looking at individual differences in the metabolic phenotype and ways in which environmental factors can influence the metabolic phenotype. The more I study metabolism, the more important I am that, more convinced I am that behavior is ultimately important in this. So at the end of the talk, even though we're going to concentrate a good bit on metabolism, we're going to come back to behavior. And I think you can see that, you'll be able to see that you really have to consider these in combination to really understand how an individual reaches a settling point of, of body weight and body composition. Now, the factors, diet composition and exercise that I'm going to talk about today can influence each aspect of the energy balance equation. And the point here is that by manipulating physical activity and diet composition, you can reach a new settling point. This isn't resetting the set point. This is just changing the system so that it re-equilibrates at a different settling point and a different body composition. And we'll come back and talk some more about this at the end. So the two non-genetic factors likely to influence obesity development are diet and physical activity in a, in a very broad sense. And here we're going to look at diet composition. Here we're going to look at physical activity. And there's a prevailing feeling today that obesity can be prevented or treated by a low-fat diet and high levels of physical activity. The popular press tells you this. Uh, sort of the man on the street believes that a low-fat diet and, and high levels of physical activity is the thing we should be doing if we want to treat obesity or prevent it. And by and large, I think both these things can have a very positive outcome on treating obesity or preventing obesity. Uh, there, there aren't any long-term trials in which we've really looked at the effectiveness of a low-fat diet and high levels of exercise on either tr treating or preventing obesity. There's a lot of experimental data which suggests this should be a good prevention or treatment strategy. However, I don't think it's the only answer. I think there are going to be some people who will be affected a great deal by such a regimen and others which won't. I approach body weight regulation from an energy balance viewpoint. If we take a person who's weight stable, then they have to be in a situation where the energy intake equals the energy expenditure. This produces a stable body weight and a stable body composition. So on one simple level, it looks like all we have to do is measure energy intake, measure energy expenditure, and measure body composition, and we can really understand what's going on. Uh, but I guess there's some question as to whether we can measure any of these accurately enough. So it's a, it's a major challenge, really, to do this all in one study. In addition to balancing energy, an individual who's weight stable and has a stable body composition is also in balance for each of the macronutrients. This has to be the case. The intake of fat has to equal the oxidation of fat. Intake of carbohydrate equals oxidation, etc. If this isn't the case, then you accumulate or you lose stored energy from one of these compartments. So it's important to realize at the outset, if we start out with a person who is in energy balance, there's an equality of energy and there's a quality of nutrients. When we talk toward the end of the talk about <coughs> diet composition, uh, you'll begin to see why it's important not just to look at the total energy in and out, but the composition of energy in and out, because the relationship between the intake and oxidation of fat is different than the relationship between the intake and oxidation of either carbohydrate or protein. Let me spend just a minute on telling you in my laboratory how we deal with measurements of these issues because the kinds of studies that we're going to do is to manipulate exercise or manipulate diet composition and look at the effects on the energy balance and on nutrient balance. In general, most of our strategy has been, since we can't measure this very well, to fix intake. So this is the variable that we control, the amount of energy intake and the composition. We measure energy expenditure. Uh, in a way, I'll show you in a minute, we measure body composition, usually with underwater weighing, although we do a number of other uh, techniques. So this is the one we're controlling. We're measuring here, here, and we're measuring here. This we know from what goes in. 
To turn for a minute to the energy expenditure side, let's look at the components that we may be dealing with when we measure daily energy expenditure. The height of the bar would be an individual's total daily energy expenditure. Uh, lots of people break it down into different components. Some people disagree about the exact components, but this is a typical way that we might break up 24-hour energy expenditure. The lowest uh, energy expenditure occurs during sleep. We'll call it sleeping metabolic rate. If you have a whole room calorimeter like we do, you can measure this reproducibly. It's the most reproducible measure within an individual. If an individual is lying quietly awake at rest, energy expenditure is a little bit higher. So resting metabolic rate is higher than sleeping metabolic rate. This varies from about 5 to 15 percent. We'll call it arousal, but we really don't, don't understand uh, the reasons for this difference. Resting metabolic rate is the most frequently measured component of energy expenditure. Probably about 99 percent of the literature measuring energy expenditure measures this component, usually about a 5 to 30 minute measurement and uh, sometimes extrapolating for longer periods of time. When you eat a meal, energy expenditure goes up. This is called the thermic effect of food. It may be some 8 to 10 percent of total energy expenditure. The remainder that I call the energy expended in, in activity is the most variable and the most difficult component of energy expenditure to measure. I will show you some data a little later on to try to convince you that understanding this component, the reasons for within and between subject variation may be very important to the understanding of obesity. This is the way we measure energy expenditure. This is a live-in whole room calorimeter which the person stays in for 24 hours or longer. We've done studies up to 10 days in duration. You can see that it's uh, pretty similar to a, a room at the Hyatt Regency. Uh, TV, a toilet, you can even look outside and watch the traffic go by. Uh, the advantages to the room calorimeter are many. There are some limitations, but there are some advantages. Because we control the environment so carefully, we can measure energy expenditure with a high degree of accuracy, about a 1% error as compared to uh, many other systems which have, uh, you know, 8 to 10 percent error. This is a very accurate way of measuring energy expenditure. We can measure continuously over the day or over several days. We actually make our measurements over uh, one minute time period, so we get a very quick response and we get this throughout the day. Um, the limitations are that uh, probably not many of you would, uh, would uh, undergo your normal level of physical activity if I put you inside this room for 24 hours. So by putting someone in and expecting that we're going to measure their usual daily energy expenditure is erroneous. So we have to, you know, we have to deal with that. The number one use of the calorimeter really is to look at how the system responds so that when we vary exercise or vary physical activity, we can look at how energy expenditure responds. We're actually doing some studies in which we try to assess daily energy expenditure and reproduce it in the calorimeter, and we're getting closer, but it's still difficult to do that. So we have high accuracy, we can do long-term measurements, but we aren't measuring in naturalistic conditions. We call them semi-naturalistic conditions. Let me show you uh, one of the things that makes our room calorimeter unique. We have a force platform inside. It's not visible in this picture. This was taken before the force platform was put in. But the force platform covers the living area. It's on force transducers. It measures the amount of work delivered by the person to the floor. This is very useful because it allows us to really quantify the energy expended in physical activity. You can see, obviously, the calculations are straightforward. Just kidding. Uh, here's the kind of uh, output we get in the way that we would use our floor. This measurement here is a measure of work performed measured by our force platform. And here's a blow up down here. Uh, we associate that with energy expenditure and we get a quick response time so that for, for this individual doing walk tests or step tests, we have the amount of work performed, the amount of energy expenditure associated with that so that we can do efficiencies, how much work is delivered per amount of energy expended. So that's one of the uh, aspects that makes our calorimeter unique is that we can measure these kinds of, uh, of things. Now here's a typical 24-hour recording of an individual in the room calorimeter. This is energy expenditure in kcals per minute measured over the daytime. We generally put people in the morning. At night it goes down. This is, uh, it's, it's usually pretty stable. This is just not our best subject but not our worst. When the person wakes up in the morning you can see it comes up again. This is respiratory quotient. We use it to determine the uh, composition of the fuel burned, and this is our measure of, of work. A couple more slides just to show you here. This would be energy expenditure in a typical sedentary person. This is someone we put in the room for 24 hours without any instructions to exercise, and they were fairly sedentary. And I'm going to show you on the next slide an individual 
who uh, went in with some specified work to show you the difference in energy expenditure. So you can see here are the periods where we had the person do planned exercise. And I always show this slide to demonstrate the uh, enormous impact that physical activity can have on energy expenditure. The other thing that we can do with our room calorimeter, uh, we can get an energy balance because we know the amount of energy going in. Uh, the dietitians on the Clinical Research Center tell us that. We know the expenditure, so we can get the height of these bars, and we can determine if a person is in zero, negative, or positive energy balance. Additionally, we can do nutrient balance studies. We know the composition of food that we deliver to the person, and from the uh, results of the calorimeter, we can actually divide that into fat oxidation, carbohydrate oxidation, and protein oxidation. So it's possible to do both energy balance studies and nutrient balance studies. So when we vary physical activity or vary diet composition, we're interested in both the effects on overall energy balance and the effects on balance of fat, carbohydrate, and protein. This is one of the, the real advantages to having a, a room calorimeter. It's one of the a uh, few tools in which you can get both energy balance and nutrient balance information. Now let's turn to exercise and, and let's start out with, uh, uh, with this hypothesis that, that I'm pretty convinced is true. Exercise must produce negative energy and nutrient balance unless, unless there's compensation. How can compensation occur? Via food intake. In other words, you increase your food intake to match the energy you expend in exercise. And here we're talking about increasing both the amount of food equal to the energy expended in exercise and the composition of that increase has to be equal to the composition of the excess fuel you burn during exercise. Unless that occurs, then you're going to produce some negative energy and nutrient balance. The other way that compensation can occur is via reductions in spontaneous physical activity. So if, if I were to put someone on an exercise program and have them walk three times a week, they might become more sedentary in, in, in the rest of their life. There's really no evidence that this occurs, although we don't have very good techniques to look at it. So we have to, uh, we have to raise this as a possibility, but I'm, I'm pretty skeptical that there's this sort of compensation for planned physical activity. Now, in order to adequately evaluate effects of exercise in obesity treatment, the expected effects of exercise must be considered. There's almost certainly some compensation in food intake when we add exercise. So if you're doing a study, for example, you want to look at the effects of exercise in obesity, you plan very carefully how much energy is going to be expended in the exercise, and then you uh, plan for people to lose that amount of weight equal to that energy, it isn't going to happen because there's going to be some compensation via food intake. So you have to be realistic in the overall amount of negative energy balance that you produce. It will be less than the energy expended in the activity and the amount will be determined by how much compensation occurs. And this is an area where we desperately need additional research to look at how people compensate for exercise. Who does, who doesn't, what's the composition of, of the compensation, et cetera. Um, how does exercise affect energy expenditure? Well, it's been hypothesized to, expect, to affect every single aspect of daily energy expenditure. I don't want to spend a lot of time on the data regarding the acute and chronic effects of exercise on these components. I'll go through it quickly and give you my summary of, of, uh, of the interpretation of the data. Uh, a lot of people think that, well, well, clearly after exercise, energy expenditure doesn't come down to resting. So if this is resting metabolic rate, uh, your energy expenditure goes up during exercise, it doesn't immediately come down. There's some post-exercise energy expenditure. There may be some extra fat oxidation during this period. The, it clearly occurs. What is debated is the magnitude of this increase and the importance for overall energy balance. And most data now shows that it's pretty insignificant unless you're talking about very, very heavy exercise of long duration of the kind that only highly fit individuals could do. So for obese people, this is likely to be pretty trivial and to be down to baseline in a few minutes. The, uh, one of the other debated areas is the effect of, um, of chronic exercise on resting metabolic rate. So you'll see some controversy in the literature concerning whether trained athletes have a higher resting metabolic rate over and above changes in body composition than non-trained. I'm presenting one slide from a study we did recently in which we did a cross-sectional study of 78 men and women uh, varying in fitness levels and we wanted, we studied them in a room calorimeter, we wanted to see if fitness level was related to resting metabolic rate independently of body composition. 
We know that fat-free mass is a major predictor of energy expenditure. So all components of energy expenditure, we measured whole day and then we divided it into sleeping, resting, thermic effect of food, energy expended and physical activity. All of them were significantly correlated with fat-free mass. However, four of them were significantly correlated with VO2 max. This is independent regression analysis. However, when we did multiple regression analysis, once we accounted for fat-free mass, then VO2 max wasn't significant in any case. So we interpreted this to mean that, that yes, uh, athletes have higher resting metabolic rate, but it's totally due to differences in body composition. So there aren't, we don't believe there are any direct effects of chronic exercise on resting metabolic rate. Those effects are indirect and mediated via body composition. Doesn't mean exercise isn't important. It still has positive effects because it has positive effects on body composition. If you look at the effects of exercise, either acute or chronic, on the thermic effect of food, you can find virtually any answer you want from the literature. You can find increases, decreases, no effects. Uh, I've concluded it's pretty impossible from the current data to really conclude anything here. And I think there's some real problems with the way we measure the thermic effect of food and what we're measuring. So right now, uh, be aware of this, but there's no consistent data suggesting that physical activity has a consistent effect on the thermic effect of food. The final component is the energy expended in physical activity. And I, I think of that as, as um, consisting of two components. The amount of physical activity or work you perform, and that's probably the thing that's quite variable. How active are you? How much do you exercise? How much work do you perform? That's a big determinant of this uh, component. The other one is the energy cost of physical activity or the efficiency of exercise. And we know we really know very little about both of these because we don't have good methods of measuring how active a person is and we don't until our force platform didn't have good measures of looking at uh, the efficiency of physical activity so we're real interested in this component and let me tell you why I think it's particularly important uh, three pieces of data to suggest that this is a component of energy expenditure that's much more variable than the other components here's a study uh, Livingstone in which they used activity questionnaires, a pretty crude way of determining energy expenditure of activity, but just by the questionnaires they found the range to be 1.44 to 2.57 times BMR. Uh, you know, if someone has a BMR of 1800 calories, this is a huge range of daily variation in this component. Analyzing studies that we've done in our room calorimeter in which we just put people in with no instructions to exercise, no bicycle, no treadmill, analyzing how much energy they expend and it varies considerably, a low of 200 and a high of 1,000 calories a day. Here's a person that's expending 1,000 calories a day in physical activity in that small room that I showed you earlier. Here's another one. Uh, this person, you know, probably only got up from the couch one time during the day. Very low levels of physical activity. This kind of variation inside a small room, imagine uh, how wide this variation would be in, in, uh, in real life. Eric Ravison in his calorimeter finds a surprisingly similar range in the same kinds of studies, 100 to 800 calories. We obviously had one subject who was very active in there. But the point is, uh, we look for small differences in resting metabolic rates, small differences in the thermic effect of food as potentially important in the energy balance equation. Here's a component where we don't even have to look for small differences. We can look for, for large differences between subjects in energy expenditure. So I would maintain that this is an area we really need to know more about. We need to know more about why some people are active, why some people aren't. What are the determinants of amount of physical activity? And then we're quite interested in the efficiency. Are there some people who are more efficient exercisers than others? Uh, so we've demonstrated that, that exercise increases energy expenditure because if nothing else it increases it during the bout of exercise itself. It may have a small effect on resting rate, may have a small effect on the thermic effect of food. So again you're going to have an overall negative energy deficit unless you get this compensation on energy intake. Well what do we know about that? From the few studies that have been done it's quite variable. There are some studies for example which show lean people are better compensators for exercise than obese people. Uh, it may depend on the amount and type of exercise and on other characteristics of the subjects. Some recent work presented at a recent workshop on physical activity suggests that a number of psychological factors may be markers of who's going to increase food intake in response to exercise. This is an area that we really need to learn more about because the total energy deficit is going to be dependent on how much compensation there is uh, in response to exercise.
Now, exercise also affects fuel oxidation, particularly lipid oxidation, although it depends a little bit on the type of exercise. And here, when we're using exercise to treat or prevent obesity, is the goal to create negative energy balance or negative fat balance? If it's negative fat balance, there are some types of exercise that are much better at oxidizing fat than others, so we need to consider the type of exercise used. Uh, is the best exercise program for body weight control the same as the best program for cardiovascular health, where we're told to go out and exercise three times a week for 20 minutes at 70% VO2 max? Is that, that's, that will clearly improve cardiovascular health. Are there better exercise programs for obesity? Should we be exercising lower intensity, longer duration? It's an important question. Uh, does the type of exercise program used for weight control depend on the characteristics of the subject? Should we tr be trying to match the type of exercise to the subject? We can only talk about this theoretically now. I don't think we have very much basis to do this. And what we're really after is what's the best exercise program for the prevention of obesity or the treatment of obesity? And I'm always asked by uh, 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 people wanting to lose weight what the best exercise program is. And I think we can talk about the, the benefits of one type versus the other one. But before we get to that, I think the first decision is whether to exercise or not. That's the most important one is to do something. Once you've begun to exercise chronically, once you've changed your behavior, then I think we can talk about uh, one type being better than the other type. But the, the real decision is whether to do it or not. And the most important thing you can do is to begin to exercise. And then I think uh, we need to look at what do we measure to answer these questions. Are we really interested in energy expenditure, respiratory quotient, energy balance, fat balance? And I think one of the things that we have to be aware of is fat balance. Obesity is a problem of excess fat. And we can measure energy expenditure, but what we're really after is positive or negative fat balance. So to summarize, um, on exercise and energy expenditure, I think the greatest effect is during the exercise itself. There may be minor effects on other components, but, but this is enough of, enough of effect to really make a difference. Coupled with that, exercise increases fat oxidation. Regardless of the type of exercise, overall fat oxidation will be increased. Some forms may be better at this than other forms. There's no evidence for exercise compensation. I don't think we can say that people who begin an exercise program become more sedentary in daily life. And then I think this post-exercise energy expenditure is probably small and insignificant, at least for the obese individual. Uh, now, we've talked about the theoretical effects of exercise on energy intake and energy expenditure and body composition. What do the studies show? Is, is exercise an effective treatment for obesity? Well, if you look at the available studies, you would have to conclude that with exercise alone, the loss of body fat is, is modest in the available studies. In general, men lose more than women. It, that might be expected. Men have higher caloric requirements. They expend more energy in the same kinds of exercise because they have a higher body mass. Fatter subjects lose more body fat. Uh, the more you exercise, the greater the fat loss. We know very little about type of exercise. We've always used aerobic. We're beginning to look at anaerobic exercise. But the real problem here, the reason that, there, that this is fairly modest is because we're really doing short-term studies. We're looking at the effects of exercise on weight loss over a few weeks. If you look at the energetics, exercise isn't going to produce the same sort of caloric deficit that diet is. It's inappropriate to compare exercise over a 12 or 20 week program and say that you got far less weight than you got from a, a low calorie diet. Exercise is, is, if it produces a negative energy balance, it's going to be modest and it's going to be necessary to evaluate that over long periods of time. Now, there are problems with that because obese people don't want to enter a program in which they're going to have success three, four, five years later. They want success three, four, five weeks later. So part of the, the challenge is going to be if we're going to successfully use exercise to get people to have realistic expectations about the effects of exercise. I tell people who want to lose weight with just exercise uh, not to do any sort of measurements for at least six months and, and, and really a year before you're really going to be able to see very many measurable changes. Uh, so again, the short-term studies, less than 20 weeks, find the effects of exercise either alone or with food restriction on weight loss, body composition, energy expenditure very modest. This is pretty depressing. However, then you go out to the long-term studies, and by long-term I mean uh, studies which have brought people back a year after weight loss. They haven't followed them this whole period. They've gone out a year later, looked at people who were successful and people who weren't successful. And, and here now, exerciser is the best predictor of success. 
So you take the people, follow them for 20 weeks, exercise doesn't seem to really make any differences. Then you go out a year or two years later, you look at who's successful and who's not, and whether or not they're exercising is a good predictor of success. So it really suggests that if we're going to understand the effects of exercise, we have to get rid of the 20-week studies, not nearly long enough, and we have to do the long-term studies. Now these are difficult to do. They require lots of NIH funding, Jay. So, but, but these are the kinds of studies that I think are needed and really in order to understand exercise. If we're using exercise as a treatment for obesity, one of the uh, important points that came out of the workshop, I think, is that we may have to consider these two separately. Inactivity is a very uh, attractive uh, behavior in this country. So we may have to decrease inactivity. That may be a different sort of target than increasing activity. Decreasing inactivity, in other words, getting a person to be more active just in their lifestyle, not even planned exercise, could have a tremendous impact upon energy balance. And that may take a different strategy than trying to increase activity per se. Let's switch gears a little bit for the remainder of the talk and, uh, and talk ab about diet composition. And this is uh, back to the idea that energy balance isn't enough. If we really want to understand body weight regulation, the development or the not development of obesity, we have to look at a nutrient balance uh, model rather than energy balance model. The reason is, it's very clear now that when we manipulate intake of protein and carbohydrate, oxidation is changed in the same direction very quickly, even a single meal. We add carbohydrate to a single meal, we're going to see an increase in carbohydrate oxidation immediately. So the body's adjusting protein and carbohydrate to the intake. It's a very different situation for fat because acute changes in fat intake have no effect on fat oxidation. If we were to add the same number of calories as fat that we did as carbohydrate, we're going to see no change in fat oxidation. In other words, those calories aren't compensated for, they're stored. So you can see that adding, adding fat to the diet, when fat's in excess, it's stored virtually intact, 100% efficiency, really about 98% efficiency. When carbohydrates added to the diet, you get an increase in carbohydrate oxidation. It may not be complete immediately, but the net effect is that you don't get 100% of the extra calories available for storage. So it becomes real important then to look at the fat to carbohydrate ratio in the diet and how body weight and body fat are, are responding to that. Now over time, if you were to add fat to the diet and, and keep that fat at a certain level, uh, what's going to happen is you're going to keep storing it as fat. Eventually fat oxidation is going to increase, but this seems to be subsequent to an increase in fat mass. So you add fat to the diet, you store it for a while, the fat mass gets large enough to contribute fatty acids to the circulation or whatever events are going on. Now fat oxidation increases and you're at a new steady state, but you're also at an obese steady state. So the, the fat balance becomes real important in the whole equation. Uh, and, and there's been a great deal of work to, to look at why that's the case. Why is fat, calorie for calorie, more obesity producing than carbohydrate? And I believe it is. One of the effects is that the composition of the diet has an effect on voluntary energy intake. There's a good bit of data now suggesting that voluntary energy intake is higher on high fat than low fat diets. And these are studies where individuals are put on metabolic wards or whatever. They're given a, a free choice of a high fat or high carbohydrate diet. They eat more, more total calories when they're given a high fat diet. So one of the effects is on the intake side. High fat diets produce a higher intake. Now there's a lot of evidence that fat intake does not uh, acutely promote its own oxidation. A number of studies using single meals, feeding fat over a single day, and I'll show you later we, f we fed it over a two week period, where these changes in dietary fat have virtually no effect on fat oxidation. So the excess fat is simply going into storage. Uh, carbohydrate intake does promote its own oxidation. One study here by Atchison, now there are a couple of other studies that show single meals, single days, week, two weeks of, of carbohydrate overfeeding produce big increases in carbohydrate oxidation. Now what about the chronic effects of diet? Is there evidence that car carbohydrate and fat have different effects on nutrient balance or body composition over time? Well, there hasn't been a lot of direct data here. We're extrapolating from the acute studies. We're showing that fat has no effect on fat oxidation. Carbohydrate does have an effect on carbohydrate oxidation. So we're predicting that over time, fat should, should make you fatter than carbohydrate. There are a number of rat studies in which this has been demonstrated nicely. Calorie for calorie over long periods of time, 
rats get fatter on high fat than high carbohydrate diet, and then we've relied on correlational data in humans. I'm going to show you a study we did to begin to look at the effects of, of carbohydrate and fat fed over longer periods of time. Uh, but sort of to build up to this, we've systematically looked at the influence of diet composition in relation to the overall level of energy balance. If you look at the influence of diet composition in a food restricted situation, the influence is negli negligible. If you're fixing food intake, um, the individual has no behavioral adjustment. In other words, you can't modify your food intake. The metabolic adjustment is slight. The composition of the diet has a very small effect, almost an unmeasurable effect on energy expenditure when you're eating less food than you require for your, your maintenance energy requirements. So in a food restricted situation, diet composition has a negligible effect. We did a study in which we fixed energy at maintenance and varied the fat to carbohydrate ratio in the diet. The, ca the calories were fixed, so we didn't allow any behavioral adjustment. We found here the metabolic adjustment was very slight, a, a uh, insignificant difference in energy expenditure between the high fat and the high carbohydrate diet. So here again, it's negligible. Now in an ad libitum situation, we begin to see some interesting results because now uh, there's a higher intake on the high fat diet. So you get an effect on the behavioral adjustment. You also get an effect on the metabolic adjustment. When we put individuals on ad libitum high fat versus high carbohydrate diet, what you see is that fat oxidation isn't increased by the high fat diet. Carbohydrate oxidation is increased by the high carbohydrate diet. So now you're getting a behavioral adjustment and a metabolic adjustment. So you have a high influence of diet composition. And then the study that we just completed uh, is sort of the sledgehammer effect when we really wanted to flood the system with excess carbohydrate or excess fat to look at how the system responded to that. And what I'm going to show you is the effects of diet composition under this kind of overfeeding situation are, are very high. The, even though we're not allowing a behavioral adjustment, when there's a great deal of excess available, the metabolic adjustment is high enough to have a significant effect of diet composition. And one way I think of, um, of the response to overfeeding is as a problem in fuel partitioning, and obesity may be a problem in fuel partitioning. If you look at energy coming in, the body has to do something with that. And as a first step, you can partition it between storage and oxidation. You can find in the literature a lot of the, the older studies that show you feed individuals excess calories and they expend a lot of it as heat. It's been called luxious consumption and dietary induced thermogenesis. Uh, I'll show you in our data, there's very little evidence for that, but there is some differences in partitioning excess between oxidation and storage. If, if you have energy available for storage, it can be stored in different tissues. It can be stored in fat or, or other tissues. So there's a partitioning between fat and fat-free mass. If you store it as fat, uh, you partition where you store it, intra-abdominal adipose depots, subcutaneous depots. So one of the ways that one could approach obesity is, is that it's a problem in fuel partitioning, tending to partition energy toward storage and toward fat. So in the time that's remaining, I want to show you some results of a study that we just completed. I think it will illustrate both uh, our methods in terms of measuring energy and nutrient balance. It will illustrate the effects of diet composition on body weight gain and uh, uh, present an intriguing hypothesis at the end that it may not just be dietary fat that's important. So we set out to use our whole room calorimeter to assess the effects of overfeeding fat and carbohydrate on any energy and nutrient balance. We're really interested in fat and carbohydrate. We did it in lean and obese, and I'm just going to concentrate on the first part. Uh, this is, I'll run you through the study design real quick. What we do in these kinds of conditions is we take great pains to understand what people are eating and their exercise pattern. We, they wear um, accelerometers to uh, measure their movement. We do weighed food diaries. Once we get a pretty good indication of what they're eating, we bring them in the CRC and put them on a food selected diet to verify really what they're eating. So we take great pains to during baseline to show that we can assess the energy balance of these individuals. And for the study that I'm going to show you, we were very effective at doing that. Uh, we were, the average was zero energy balance in which we, where we put people in the calorimeter at the end of baseline. So here we bring them in on a self-selected diet. At the end of that diet, they go in the calorimeter. And what we're looking for here is to demonstrate that we have them in zero energy balance, that we're feeding them just the amount of energy they need. While they're in the calorimeter, they wear the accelerometers and we have a programmed activity pattern for them. So we're matching their activity to their usual activity. And the fact that we get zero energy balance, I think means that we did a pretty good job of that. 
Then they go through two 14-day overfeeding periods. In one of these, they're given 50% excess calories in the form of carbohydrate, and the other one 50% excess calories in the form of fat. This is major overfeeding. For some of our obese individuals, we were giving them 7,000 7, calories a day. So again, the sledgehammer effect. They were in the calorimeter on days 1, 7, and 14. They were outpatients the rest of the time. One of the advantages of overfeeding is you don't have so much concern about them going out and eating uh, food that you don't know about. They were hard pressed to eat all we gave them. Each time in the calorimeter, uh, their activity was carefully matched. So what we're able to do is look over time at what happened to the excess energy. We knew how much energy we gave them. Using results from our calorimeter, we could partition that between storage and heat and then partition it between fat balance and carbohydrate balance. We had a one month washout between. These were all men, and uh, the results I'm gonna show you are based on, I think, six lean and six obese men, so 12 subjects. If you look at what happened to energy expenditure, uh, this shows day zero with the open bars, carbohydrate feeding, the uh, slanted bars, fat overfeeding. If you look at day one, seven, and 14, uh, it, energy expenditure tended to increase, not very much and highly variable. Not a big effect over 14 days. I plotted it down here just as, as change from day one so that you can see, in general, the carbohydrate produced a greater energy expenditure than did the fat, but it was highly variable, suggesting that the increase in energy expenditure was variable from subject to subject. Now, we knew how much of the excess was expended as heat, so we assumed the rest was stored. Okay, so this would show the energy storage, in other words, the, the excess energy which wasn't expended as heat. With the fat overfeeding, we found a very high efficiency of storage throughout. They were storing virtually 95% of the excess energy they, they were storing. In other words, they expended, the increase in energy expenditure was, was less than 5%. With the carbohydrate, we found on day one that storage was high, and this fits with the idea that they're storing a lot of carbohydrate as glycogen. However, on days 7 and 14, uh, excess energy storage was much lower. So with the carbohydrate overfeeding, they're partitioning more energy into expenditure and less into storage. So one difference between diets right there. Now from our balance data, from our fat, carbohydrate, and protein balance data, we could predict what was happening in terms of storing excess energy. The top slide shows uh, proportion of excess energy stored as carbohydrate during the high carbohydrate diet and during the high fat diet and basically pretty low storage throughout uh, high carbohydrate storage on day one. This is the most interesting result I think because this is our best estimate of the proportion of excess energy stored as fat. With the fat overfeeding it was very high all the way through. They were storing better than 80 percent of the excess energy as fat. Very little evidence of increased energy expenditure. With the carbohydrate overfeeding, we expected a difference between carbohydrate and fat. What was a little bit surprising is the time course. They were storing only about 50% of the excess as fat on day one, about 60 on day seven. By day 14, they were storing just as much of the excess energy as fat as, as were the ones that got fat overfeeding, okay? So to me, this raises some very interesting questions about how obesity arises. If we can project that these two would be the same out here, we really don't know. Let's assume for a minute that they would. It would suggest that the effects of diet composition would be less the longer the overfeeding. So if people get, get fat by overfeeding for sustained periods of time, the composition of the diet may not be important. However, if people get overweight by, by uh, overeating a meal here and there, uh, overeating over Thanksgiving, uh, over Christmas, then this is the point at which diet composition can have its maximal effects. So if, if, if body storage occurs from acute periods of positive energy balance, then the composition of the diet may be very important. Now one of the beauties of the calorimeter is in the next two slides I'm going to show you why this occurred. And when I show this data, uh, the first response here is that, well, you've given them a lot of excess carbohydrate and now they're making fat from carbohydrate. We didn't see any indication of that. This is the carbohydrate overfeeding. All right, the top panel is carbohydrate oxidation. What we predicted is that carbohydrate oxidation would go up with the excess carbohydrate. It did. A major increase in carbohydrate oxidation over time, just as expected. But look at what happened to fat oxidation. This is the baseline level of fat oxidation. What happened is the carbohydrate in the diet turned off fat oxidation. And one way to look at it is there was plenty of carbohydrate available for fuel. That's what they preferred to oxidize, and they didn't oxidize fat, so 
uh, fat oxidation went down. The reason they were storing fat is because now the carbohydrate has turned off fat, fat oxidation, so an amount of fat which was their usual intake at baseline is now in excess and they're storing body fat. This is what happens during fat overfeeding, basically nothing. 14 days of fat overfeeding, no significant effect on carbohydrate oxidation, a tiny insignificant effect on fat oxidation. So what's happening with fat is that it, it's not changing anything. The body isn't doing anything to compensate for the excess, that the excess fat is simply going into storage in a highly efficient manner. So I think this illustrates the important differences in the composition of calories available and, and the effects on, on body weight gain. Fat is more produ obesity producing calorie for calorie here than is carbohydrate. Now, how do we reconcile that with some epidemiology data available? It suggests that only a weak relationship between diet composition and body mass index. So I think we're left with the idea that a high fat diet probably can explain all of obesity. Not everyone is, is obese because of eating a high fat diet. Uh, and, I, and I think that's true. Not all obese people are eating a high fat diet. We're very interested in individual differences in response to diet composition, differences in the metabolic phenotype. I just wanted to show you, this is some data we have uh, where we just looked at average daily intake. This is self-report and uh, body fat percent, a weak positive relationship. So I think the idea that all obesity is due to a high fat diet is probably naive. And we went back and looked at our data on an individual basis. Okay, here we have the fat overfeeding, the carbohydrate overfeeding. This is the proportion of excess energy stored. Look at how tight the numbers are with fat overfeeding. Very little individual variation with fat overfeeding. Essentially, everybody's responding to fat the same way. They're storing most of it. Now look at carbohydrate overfeeding. You're really beginning to get some wide differences. Here's 50%, here's virtually 100%. Wide individual differences in proportion of energy stored. If we look at a proportion of excess energy stored as fat, again, here's fat, with the exception of this one subject who uh, uh, was very interesting, again, Everybody's storing excess fat very efficiently from fat. But look at carbohydrate overfeeding now. Here's where we're beginning to see the, the individual differences. And when we started the study out, we, we were hypothesizing that individual differences in the amount of fat stored on the high fat diet may be very important. Now we've sort of changed our thinking on this. And now what we think is very important is whether or not carbohydrate turns off fat oxidation. And that here's where the individual differences are going to be. That everybody's going to get fat if given a high fat diet. If given a, a diet which is high in fat, also high in carbohydrate, then some people are going to be more effective at turning off the fat oxidation and using the carbohydrate than are other people. So really what we're thinking about now is that uh, uh, the high fat diet is interesting, I think clearly linked to obesity, but there are some people which are going to be susceptible to obesity on a diet which is moderately high in fat and high in carbohydrate or possibly a, a moderately fat diet in which they overeat carbohydrate. So I think we can't just look at fat. We've got to look at some individuals who may be susceptible to preferentially burning carbohydrate and turning off fat oxidation. Uh, so to conclude, reducing dietary fat and increasing physical activity should reduce body fat content in everyone. I, I think this is a good strategy for treating and preventing obesity, and I think we need some long-term uh, trials to demonstrate this. The factors which determine the extent of this reduction have not been identified. I think some people are going to respond very well to this. Other people are going to lose a little bit of fat and a little bit of weight. A low-fat diet and increased physical activity may be an effective strategy to prevent or treat obesity in some subjects. I think what we need are we need good markers of which subjects are really going to respond to this type of diet, which types of subjects may not be responsive. When we talk about preventing obesity, I think it would be a mistake to go out and try a low-fat diet for everyone because we may get the wrong answer. We may need to identify those individuals which may be particularly responsive to a low-fat diet and then assess whether this is a, uh, a useful prevention strategy in that group. I think we have a great need to identify subjects who will respond to a low-fat diet and exercise. Now let me go back to the model, because what I've talked about are some individual differences in metabolic phenotype and how exercise and diet composition may play a role here. But what I want to emphasize is, is we haven't looked at the behavior, but the behavior is very important. In the overfeeding, for example, so what if you store fat, excess fat very efficiently? Well, behaviorally, if you never get in a situation where excess energy is available, you're not going to have any problems. However, you may be someone, again, who when excess carbohydrates available, you turn off fat oxidation. If excess carbohydrate isn't available, then it's not going to be turned off. So we can look at the metabolic phenotype, and here's how the system 
system will respond under specific conditions. The importance over here is whether or not the individual gets into those situations. And I've tried to illustrate that schematically here in looking at the interaction between behavioral and metabolic phenotypes. You may have a metabolic propensity to obesity, and by that I mean you may tend to store store excess energy efficiently, you may tend to store most of that excess energy as fat. Uh, that's going to produce a little bit of, of uh, increased susceptibility to obesity, but it also depends on the behavioral propensity. If you're an individual who has a high metabolic propensity to store energy well, and behaviorally you tend to put yourself in situations where excess energy is available, then your degree of obesity is going to be up here. So we have to look at both phenotypes. Either one gives you a, an increased susceptibility to obesity, but it's really both together that leads to this real high degree of obesity. And I think by separating them out, what we need to do is to identify markers for differences here, markers for differences here, and then when we talk about treating or preventing obesity, uh, we have to use these markers to determine which type of treatment is appropriate for which individual. Thank you very much. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Uh, two things. One, uh, if the effect of exercise is mediated through body composition, shouldn't strength training be the most effective? The second is when you're talking about, about fiber. A lot of studies uh, don't consider that when you really take in uh, complex carbohydrates, they're often with a lot of fiber. Yeah. Uh, the, the second one first, that, that's a real problem. That's a problem for our studies. And what we've done is we've gone to a group of foods that are, are very low in fiber content for, for our studies because fiber uh, gives us lots of problems in really determining the intake side of it, but, but it is a problem. Regarding the second one, it's a very interesting question. You know, for years we equated exercise with aerobic exercise. As studies are coming out with resistance exercise, some quite interesting findings. In general, the loss of body fat with the resistance training seems to be just as much as with aerobic, and you have the additional benefit that you either preserve or increase muscle mass. So from the acute studies that are coming out, there's some indication that resistant exercise may be useful for obesity. It may you know, get rid of fat just as much as the aerobic and maintain lean body mass. And since lean body mass is a determinant of energy expenditure, you know, that could have some long-term benefits. We don't have any long-term studies with uh, resistance training. Other questions? Jim, do you want to talk about the, some of the discussion that occurred at the conference last December on maintenance of level of uh, yeah. lean body mass with resistance training versus aerobic training and the frequency of exercise? And, and then the other question would be, are you aware of studies actually looking at the degree of energy expenditure uh, with periods of aerobic exercise versus periods of resistance type of exercise? Yeah, um, the first one, when uh, resistance training is added to a weight loss program, it seems to be very effective at maintaining uh, lean body mass. And if, if a goal is to maintain lean body mass during obesity treatment, then resistant exercise may be important there. And another uh, major issue that came up was how much exercise does it take to get a positive metabolic effect, and then how much does it take to sustain that? I mean, one of the things that we know about exercise, if you uh, quit exercising, you lose the positive effects very quickly. So one of the ideas is once you achieve whatever positive metabolic effects you want with exercise, I, I, sort of what's the minimum then that you can do to maintain those effects? And, and that's something that's quite interesting, but there's, there's no data on it. Regarding the effects of uh, energy expenditure during the aerobic and, and the uh, resistance training, it really depends on a, on a lot of factors, on intensity-related intensity factors and subject characteristics. The major difference, one of the major differences is the fuel utilized because the uh, uh, resistance training tends to utilize carbohydrate, tends to be intense, uh, utilizing glycogen stores. And the aerobic, the longer the duration, the more that uh, it should depend on fat oxidation. So that's a little surprising given the results coming out that suggest the resistance training is having just as much effect on loss of body fat than is aerobic. 
That's two tough questions. Um, the question is, uh, how do we know what's the appropriate body weight? And what we've done in the past is to try to relate body weight or more recently body mass index to mortality. And there's the typical sort of J-shaped relationship where um, at the low body mass index there may be a little increased mortality and you know at the high end it goes up with body mass index and we take sort of the steady state as saying well this is the lowest mortality so this is sort of the appropriate uh, weight and, and body fat for an individual. It's an issue which is, which is hotly debated. Uh, how do you define that? We know, for example, that it's not just the amount of body fat you have, it's where it is. So if you're, you know, if you're a woman with the body fat in the you know, subcutaneous lower body fat, which isn't strongly linked with negative metabolic effects, should we be evaluating your weight differently than if you're a man with intra-abdominal fat, which is known to be linked to that? So that's not an easy question. This, the second one is, is obesity necessarily bad? And again, I think we have to look at the, the distribution of body fat. We know that intra-abdominal body fat is strongly linked to diabetes, cardiovascular disease, et cetera. I think where it's not quite so clear is where you have an, an, an overweight female with lower body fat in which the, the risk of those diseases uh, may be very similar to a lean man. And the question is there, should we be treating that obesity? That's an issue that has come up at, at all of the obesity meetings over the last few years and has generated a great deal of discussion. And at this point, uh, ind there are individuals who are adamant on one side or the other, but there's certainly no consensus. I think if we link it to mortality, there certainly is a question that can be raised about the, the uh, woman with the lower body fat. Is she at risk for, for, uh, for bad things? And if not, should we do something? It, it's really an open question. Yeah, it's a good question. Right. Yeah, we, we've done a great deal of work in that area uh, with the rat model. And I can tell you in the rat that the only type of fat we've found so far that makes a difference is a diet high in omega-3, fish oil. Uh, in, in that case, the animals uh, with comparable fat in the diet don't get as fat. They maintain insulin sensitivity. Uh, if we look at saturated versus unsaturated, we find some interesting differences in the way the obesity develops. But in the long run, uh, they're equally obese and uh, pretty minor differences between, say, corn oil and, and, and lard as a fat source. Whereas if you go to something like fish oil, it is very different. Uh, but this is a diet containing fairly high amounts of fish oil. Yes, Barbara. that as he increased the exercise, food intake increased, and body weight stayed stable, except for the extremes. Mm -hmm. That is, when the exercise was so much, yeah. it's because of right. exhaustion, right. or so little, it's to be literally sedentary. Yeah, so you're so the, the, the sedentary people and the real uh, ultra-athletes. And, and if you look at the ultra-athletes, and we've studied some of these, and, and I think their problem is getting enough calories in. Their, their energy expenditure is so high. I mean, you can only spend so many hours in the day eating, and, and their calorie demands are so high, and they typically consume a high-carbohydrate diet. I think you're right, and I, I think the key may be getting people in the middle, or at least getting the sedentary people in the middle. Uh, if you look at our hypothesis about sort of reductions in, in, in lipid oxidation really being predictive of obesity development. Exercise is, is the most obvious thing that can influence that because does, whatever form of exercise you do, your total lipid oxidation is going to increase, particularly if you do aerobic types of exercise consistently. This is a way to get your lipid oxidation up. So if you're someone who tends to, when you eat carbohydrates, suppress lipid oxidation, one of the best things you can do to, to get around that is, is to have a high level of oxidation, of exercise that keeps your lipid oxidation high. So I think, yes, get, getting people into that, at least the moderate exercise range, may be very important. Getting back to your previous comment about the omega-3 fatty acids, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the controversy in that area with regard to human studies. Uh, in your discussions with other investigators, have you come to any resolution? How do you interpret your observations versus the, the slight but distinct worsening of 
uh, glucose homeostasis in humans that are fed high omega-3 uh, diets? Yeah, I don't know. It may be a dose effect because the humans don't get, get nearly so much. But we find with the rats um, that as, as the, you know, in, in uh, a year of feeding the omega-3s, they, they really maintain a, a, a very high level of insulin sensitivity. But these are diets containing 40% of calories from fat and, and most of that from omega-3. So I don't know. It may be a dose effect. It may be a rat-human difference. I, I, you know, I think we, we need to learn a lot more about the omega-3s before we start promoting omega-3s as, as sort of anti-obesity fats because I think there may be some drawbacks to those. Uh, and in the rat studies, we're, we're particularly interested in looking at the mechanisms whereby the, uh, are really looking at where the omega-3 fatty acids are going when we put it in the diet. So I think it's too soon to say that this is the fat that should be included uh, in, in large quantities in the diet. Yes? There are people that, that argue for the set point. Uh, one of the problems that I have with the set point is, is uh, I guess I was taught that, it, that a good theory, should, you should be able to disprove it, and, and you really can't with the set point. If you do a manipulation and everything stays the same, well, they say, well, you know, set point works. If it changes, they say, well, you changed the set point. So, uh, you know, I don't, in concept, the set point and the settling point aren't very different. The, the difference in the settling point is that it's not that you're regulating anything per se. Body weight and body composition sort of are the result of a lot of other regulated systems. And when you change any of those systems, the system is going to re-equilibrate, reach a new settling point. Dose effect, because the humans don't get, get nearly so much. But we find with the rats um, that There are people that, that argue for the set point. Uh, one of the problems that I have with the set point is, is uh, I guess I was taught that, it, that a good theory, should, you should be able to disprove it. And, and you really can't with the set point. If you do a manipulation and everything stays the same, well, they say, well, you know, set point works. If it changes, they say, well, you change the set point. So, uh, you know, I don't, in concept, the set point and the settling point aren't very different. The, the difference in the settling point is that it's not that you're regulating anything per se. Body weight and body composition sort of are the result of a lot of other regulated systems. And when you change any of those systems, the system is going to re-equilibrate, reach a new settling point. So, right the set point that, yes, it Yeah, it's, it's easier to gain weight than lose weight. And, and the question is, is, is that a metabolic phenomenon or is that really a behavioral phenomenon? And I don't know. I, th I think probably everybody in this room would agree it's easier to gain weight than lose it. Uh, but I don't know that that argues necessarily for a set point. In the set point theory, we, we really don't know. The people that are arguing for the set point, it's not clear what it is that's regulated. Is it body fat? Is it body weight? Is it body temperature? There are a lot of things that could be regulated. And yes, the system responds as if there were a set point. But things like exercise, for example, seem to, uh, if you add exercise chronically to a rat or to a human, you're going to change the level of body weight and level of body fat. Is that changing the set point? Or is that just the system responding to other kinds of conditions? I think largely we're, we're talking semantics here. I think everybody realizes is that, um, that there are lots of things like activity and diet composition that can cause you to end up with a different body weight and body composition. Then I think it's interesting to look at the mechanisms there. Do those mechanisms respond more like a temperature control system or is the system just responding to the, the end result of other regulated systems? Yes.
good question. Uh, both. What, what seems to happen is, uh, uh, it depends a little bit on stage of life. There are some stages in life where it's sort of a critical period for developing fat cell number. But in general, the first response is for the fat cells to get bigger. So you have excess fat that needs to be stored somewhere. You have a lot of fat cells. First thing that happens is they get bigger. At some point, then they recruit new fat cells. And the factors regulating this are you know, an area of great interest. Uh, we need to learn more about why does one fat cell possibly send out a signal which recruits new fat cells. So in, in every form of obesity, you're going to find increased cell size. You may or may not find increased cell number. In some models you do, some models you don't. If we overfeed, and the other thing is that increase in cell number can occur any time in life. We used to think it was only occurred if you, you know, got fat early in life, but we can take adult rats, feed them high fat diets, and we can produce increase in cell number at any time in life. And just related to that, is there ever a, a case where an actual cell is lost, or is it? Yeah, unfortunately, uh, we haven't found anything that can get rid of cells. You, you can change their size and make them small, but if you have a lot of them, you're still going to have a lot of small cells. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. And, I, you know, a couple of things come to mind, and, and this is just speculation. I think it would be real interesting to look at what happens to, uh, uh, to fuel oxidation after the resistance training. So you may get increased carbohydrate during the exercise itself. What's it doing to uh, fuel metabolism later in that day and the next day and so forth? So I'd like to see some longer term studies there. Uh, one, one, I guess one hypothesis is that a, that a calorie deficit is a calorie deficit. If you expend the same number of calories, even if it's from carbohydrate, that it's having the same effect on, on fat loss. I have trouble accepting that, so I'm, I'm looking for other kinds of explanations. But the, these studies are really short term, a few weeks, uh, 10 weeks, 12 weeks. I think it's important to follow that out and see if the, if the loss of fat ultimately is the same in the two conditions. In terms of the, of the lean subjects, um, you, you know, if you take a, a chronic exercising subjects that are in energy balance, then um, you know, what, you're going to see intake equal expenditure. I guess the question is, are people trained aerobically leaner than people trained sort of with resistance training? And, and it's a mixed bag. In, in a very general sense, the, the leanest are usually the, the distance runners, but you do find some resistance trainers that are pretty lean. So I think it's impossible to, just on the, on the basis of looking at chronic athletes, to sort out those effects. But there are some resistance trained athletes that tend to be pretty lean. Weightlifters, not so much, but some of the other ones tend to be lean. Yeah, in fact, that's, we're looking at insulin sensitivity as a key in the whole thing. I, I, you know, I, I think insulin sensitivity may be one of the mechanisms uh, that underlies fuel partitioning and uh, d determines what's going on. It's, it's a complicated sort of area to know exactly what's happening. And, and one of the things about insulin sensitivity is you really have to define how you're measuring it. There's whole body insulin sensitivity, which is a reflection of a lot of different tissues. Then you can look at insulin sensitivity differently in the different tissues. And one of the things that we're interested in is sort of the time course. As we feed high fat diets, what happens to the time course of development of insulin resistance in the different tissues? And in general, with high fat diets, uh, you see resistance at the liver first and resistance in the adipocyte comes much later. So there may be these periods where you get differential insulin sensitivity in different tissues that may be influencing the partitioning of fuel from one, one tissue to another. So I think the insulin insulin sensitivity really is a, is a key player in that. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, you know, this is an area that, that I'm not up on, and some other people may want to answer it, but it seemed like when that first came out, everybody was poo-pooing it and saying that you take them out and they grow right back. And then it seems like I saw some interesting studies to suggest it wasn't quite that simple, that there may actually be some, some permanent effects, at least that it doesn't come back in that particular depot. Uh, so so that's, that's my only recollection of where the field stands. I don't know, Van, do you want to comment on that? Your group out in Colorado now may get some more information uh, to know that they are looking at the question uh, in a preliminary way right now. But again, it has to be recognized that most of the fat cells that are removed during liposuction are subcutaneous That's and right. not um, the what we feel are the more metabolically active, uh, at least with regard to the health risks of, of the visceral fat or intra-abdominal fat. Uh, so its influence on health risk we would speculate at the moment to uh, not have a major impact, but again, we don't have studies to back that up. Okay. From the overfeeding studies, is there any data to suggest that the diet composition causes different uh, distribution of, fatty, of fat uh, deposition? Yeah, um, there are no data, but I think it's an interesting question. And I, you know, I think um, in terms of individu individual differences in metabolic phenotype, I think one of the places we could see important differences would be, you know, two people may store the excess with really the same degree of efficiency, but if it goes intra-abdominally one and more subcutaneous in the other one, that could be an important difference. Um, I know that uh, Claude Bouchard has some data which suggests that twins respond similarly in terms of just the amount of fat versus lean mass that they put on during overfeeding, but I don't know any data about the, uh, the distribution per se. I think that's more tightly regulated, but their diet was an ad-lib diet. I their di that's right. Diet yeah, yeah. Yes. Just a comment and watch your reaction to okay. it. Uh, if Instead of talking about obesity, we're talking about health and mortality. What you're talking about has some interesting effect. Uh, Low-fat diet has other positive health effects, cardiovascular. Right. Uh, exercise has some other positive health effects. Uh, some other approaches to diet, such as very low-calorie diet, seem to promote more cycling and the there is some very disturbing evidence that people that lose a lot of weight are worse off health-wise, and it may be losing gradually, which is probably promoted by somewhat reduction in the proportion of fat and, mm -hmm. uh, and exercise, and gradual approach. If you take all those together, there should be a substantial gain on the health side from that strategy compared to other strategies. I agree with your last statement that, that I think there may be some advantages there. I think some of the data you're referring to on the potential uh, negative effects of weight loss, some of the epidemiological data, and I think as that data is being reanalyzed, separating out voluntary from involuntary weight loss, it's the involuntary weight loss that has accounted for that. So. I don't know that we can use that as a reason per se, but I've always been intrigued by the idea that the, uh, the, the, the slow weight loss may be beneficial. Now, there's, there's very little data in support of that uh, because most any kind of diet that has been used has been largely unsuccessful in the long run, that you get weight regain, regain after the moderate diets versus the very low-calorie diets. But, but it seemed to me that there may possibly be some advantages to this sort of slow sort of weight loss, but I think the, the objective data are... Well, again, you're, you're talking about a very controversial area, and uh, we've done a lot of cycling work primarily in the animal models, and we, we've never found any of those effects. So I'm skeptical of, of the effects, at least in terms of body weight gain, the idea being that you lose fat and lean, and you gain back more fat than you do lean, and that ultimately the cycling is producing a more, more obese state. Uh, I, I tend to be very skeptical of that, and in looking at the data in the literature, I don't think there's a lot of support for it, but it's a highly controversial issue. You'll find a lot of people that would stand up here and say that it, that it is bad. I don't think it is, so I don't think that's the reason, but I still think that, that a, a, a slow sort of weight loss, and it may be behaviorally, it may be that it gives you time, ultimately, whether you keep it off or not, it's going to depend on if your behavior can match your new lower body weight. If it can't, you're going to go back up, and a slower weight of rate of weight loss may in some people 
give them a better chance to adjust their behavior so that ultimately they're going to keep the weight off. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. If you look at the typical American diet, which is now somewhere around, uh, I don't know, 37, 38% of calories from fat, the question is, what's the optimum diet for weight loss? American Heart Association you know, tells us to go down to 30, and eventually we would want to go down to 20. Um, I think it really depends on the person. I think that everybody is going to experience some weight loss from lowering dietary fat, but I think it's going to be difficult to predict between and within indivi in individuals because really what's going to happen is if you lower your dietary fat, your, your fat oxidation for a while is going to be higher than your intake. You're going to lose body fat mass. The amount of fat mass you lose depends upon how long it takes you to re-equilibrate. How long does it take you to adjust your fat oxidation down? And that's something that, that, that I don't think we have any way of predicting. So that in some people, uh, you know, I think switching from a 38 to a 30% fat diet would have a big effect. Other people, uh, you know, switching a larger lowering of fat may have a lesser effect. So I think it's going to depend on a lot of these individual differences in metabolic phenotype. But I think in general the strategy is uh, the lower the better. Now, you know, if we're talking about a 20% fat diet, I think it's very difficult to, uh, to eat a 20% fat diet and, and live a normal lifestyle. So I don't think there would be anything wrong with that. I think you, many of us would be better off if we could do it. If you look at how much fat we really need to be healthy, it's only a couple of percent of, 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 of our calories for essential fatty acids. So I don't think we have to worry about getting our, our fat down too low. So I think sort of the lower the better. But you've got to have a level that you can maintain. You've got to be able to change your lifestyle so that you can make a permanent reduction in that. Well, if you're looking at sort of the relationship between dietary intake of these and energy metabolism, uh, I don't know of any data that's looked at that systematically, you know, relationship of the vitamins to, uh, uh, to diet composition and, and, and energy expenditure or energy metabolism. I, I don't know of any, you know, that's specifically looked at that. Well, there, there are a lot of studies about meal patterning, and again, the results aren't, aren't consistent at all. Uh, but the idea has always intrigued me because we know there's a, there's a pattern to metabolism during the day, and, and I, I think it would make some sense that within an individual, the pattern in which you, you consume the food uh, in relation to your pattern of metabolism uh, may play a role. From the reading of the literature, there, there's no strong consensus that that's the case. I think there are a lot of evidence, a lot of them are rat studies, in, in which uh, fairly substantial alterations in meal patterning affected uh, lipogenic enzymes, et cetera, which, which could potentially play a role. So I think at present it remains an intriguing hypothesis, and I'm particularly pretty interested in that. I, I think there are lots of reasons why it could make a difference, but in terms of uh, you know, concrete advice that we ought to be getting, data in support of that right now. Yeah, it's an interesting question, and, and, and as far as I know, I don't think uh, resistance has ever been used in maintenance. I, I don't know of any studies that have used anything there except aerobic. Hopefully those are going on now as people are, are more aware that aerobic isn't the only kind of exercise, but in terms of maintenance, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, this idea though, think about it, it, it if you're saying that uh, the obese individual which has more fat-free mass to start with, we know that, obese individuals have more. Now, I'm not sure that we know it's beneficial to minimize that during weight reduction. I think you could make that argument. It relates to energy expenditure and so forth, but are you really, when you lose fat-free mass with weight loss, are you really just returning to a normal situation anyway? So I think the first question is whether it's desirable to minimize fat-free mass loss. You certainly could argue it is, and I'm not arguing it isn't, but 
you know, what's the composition? Fat-free mass is a, a heterogeneous tissue, everything except fat. So what we don't know is what's the composition of that increased fat-free mass that occurs when you get obese, and then when you go back down, are you simply losing that extra that you put on? Um, yeah, in, th in this particular study, we used a lot of simple carbohydrates just because, you know, we had to get all this food in and we were, we were limited in the kind that we could do. I think that's a question that's unanswered. I think it's an interesting question. Our carbohydrate overfeeding, uh, we used real foods. We didn't want to use formula diets, so we had the dietitians work with the individuals to the foods that they liked and w that would eat, and they tended in this study largely to be simple carbohydrates. So. We don't have any data on that, but I think it's a very important question. You done? I'll free you up. I want to, again, uh, thank Jim and thank everybody uh, for coming out this evening. i also like to remind you that uh, the next lecture in this series will be on Wednesday, February 10th, uh, and entitled Human Studies on Obesity. It will be presented by Dr. Jules Hirsch, who's physician in chief at the Rockefeller University in New York City. And we are also uh, making this lecture a tribute to uh, Dr. Henry Sabrell, who is a former institute director of our uh, institute and as a former NIH director as well, and who contributed significantly to the studies of obesity, especially human obesity. Uh, and we. He uh, passed away this past fall, and this will be a special tribute to him as well. Again, remind you that for the dietitians, there is a sign-up sheet in the back uh, for CEU uh, credits. And anybody that wants to be placed on a mailing list that isn't already on the mailing list, if they could leave their name on the sheet of paper in the back as well. Thank you all for coming out. <laughs>